philosophical lecture shorts, and today we're going to be giving a short lecture on the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, now, in my classes, you know, uh, usually I'll read these certain passages. For time's sake, I won't do it. I'll just show you where they are. Uh, in the gay science, uh, we are concentrating on passage 57, 108, and especially 125, which is the madman, one of the most important, I think, passages in all of Nietzsche. Um, and beyond good and evil, 53 and 55, and then the prologue I gave you will be really important when we talk about the Ubermensch will be in the next video. Now, all the stuff that I gave you is important what we're talking about, and I'm trying to give you an idea of what Nietzsche is saying throughout all his books, okay? Um, but as I understand, this is an interpretation I have of him, okay? Now, what we'll see is what Nietzsche is trying to do is he is basically diagnosing with the Western tradition. He thinks there has been a way in which we've thought since Plato that we have a hard time getting outside of, and basically it's causing a certain, um, we'll see, a certain dangerous time period we're in, and that time period is now. And so what his philosophy is is kind of two parts. There's a part where he's giving a diagnosis of the Western tradition, and then the second part where he makes a turn, he's trying to give maybe some type of possible antidote, or at least looking towards where we might be, need to go to get beyond this diagnosis, okay? And his critique basically begins here. I mean, that's what we're going to concentrate here in the first video, his critique of Western culture. He thinks that since Plato, Western culture has been obsessed with this idea of transcendence. Okay? And what that basically means is uh, transcendence is this idea of trying to get outside of ourselves to some higher level, some higher plane. Okay? Um, transcending something. Uh, the best way to understand it is how far okay, we can now distance ourselves, distance ourselves from where we find ourselves. We find ourselves. Obviously, where we find ourselves is right here in nature, okay? Whatever that is, of course, our thrown existence, all of us live in a maybe a different time period, but we're thrown into a certain particular situation, the world. And what transcendence has to do is how can I get from this spot I'm in to some higher level, get into some higher plane, okay? That's what he thinks transcendence is. Um, and basically, he says, like I said, since Plato, we've been obsessed with this idea. And what he's saying is basically since then, we have just kind of regurgitated the same idea Plato gave us over and over and over and over again. And we eventually get to a period in which we think we've gotten beyond it, but really, it's Plato all over again. It's just, it's so ingrained in us, we can't even realize it. And what Nietzsche wants to do is to realize it and also realize the dilemma that this puts us in. Okay? So, what does he mean by this? So, let's kind of talk about Plato. Uh, we're going to need a little philosophy pop-up here uh, to understand what he's talking about. And Plato's main idea is what he calls the theory of the forms. And basically what Plato does is this. He separates two worlds. Okay? He says the world we are born into is the world of appearances. And this line here, below the line is going to represent the world of appearance. So we'll put this here. Okay? In the world of appearance are all the normal things that we come across, like you and me. There you are. Okay. There are maybe some water here. Uh, there is a cat over here. Okay, the classroom. Basically, anything that we would normally take would be in our physical existence. The world uh, that appears to us. The classroom, the camera here, the chairs, everything that's in this world. That's the world of appearance. But then he says there is another world, a world that is more important, which he calls the world of the intellect. Okay. Now, in the world of the intellect, all right. There are the same things that are in here in the world of appearances. But in the world of the intellect, when we use reason, we reason about the perfect form or idea of what it means to be a human being, or a man, or a woman, or water, or a cat, or squares, or triangles, all the things we encounter, or chairs. What we do by using our reason, we discover the perfect idea of what it means to be these things. And so we have the idea of the perfect idea of human, or the perfect idea of man and woman as well up here, and the perfect idea of what it means to be a cat, okay? The things that they must be, and the lake, and the clouds, and all the things that we see of chairs, all those things, he thinks by using our reason we determine there are these ideas in which are meaningful, which actually make the objects in the world of appearance have meaning, okay? What gives the meaning is that we can have these ideas that are perfect about them. And what Plato believes is actually the world of the intellect is the actual world, the reality, and this world that we live in is a false reality. Okay? He thinks the things that are enduring and are eternal, which he thinks the idea of what it means to be a human or what it means to be a square, what it means to be something is enduring. That will never change. But the world of appearance is, of course, human beings eventually die, uh, things deteriorate, fall apart, but the idea of what it means 
never does that. And for him, it's an assumption he's making, but things that are enduring, that are eternal, are more real than the things that are not. And so for him, the world of ideas, of forms, is actually the reality we need to try to obtain. And Plato's whole idea is to try to separate ourselves, okay, from their form of appearance and to try to eventually become totally one with the world of appear, uh, intellect, excuse me. Even though it's very hard, he says only a few people could do it, and if you could do it, you could only do it for a short time, and eventually necessity pulls you back in. But he does take it as possible. Now there's one other step about here. There's also what he calls the form of forms. So these forms, these ideas, have an ultimate idea, which gives them all light and creates them, basically. And that is the idea of what he calls the good, the form of all forms. It is the form that not only brings these things into being, it also is the plane or light that shines on them and allows us to recognize them. And he thinks the whole goal of philosophy is to know the forms and then eventually become one with the good. If you're familiar with his myth of the cave, the good is represented by the sun. When he breaks away, sees what society has shown us, climbs out of the cave, it's really hard for him to see, but eventually his eyes adjust to the actual world, and then he looks up and realizes it's the sun that's allowing this to happen. What we try to do in Plato's philosophy is to get to the good. And once we are with the good, we will know all realities and what existence really is, which is this here. And hopefully we'll separate ourselves from this place. Okay? And this is, as we see, an idea of transcendence. The point is to leave the world of appearance and get to the world of the forms, okay? And eventually unite with the good. Now, this is eventually, he says, is a, a quite powerful idea. And actually it's so powerful it will last up until now, okay? Whether we realize it or not. Um, and there's some kind of camel camouflage forms. Um, the next way we can see it is look at Aristotle. Now Aristotle critiques Plato, okay? He does, he says, Plato doesn't pay enough attention to the world of the, of the appearances. We need to observe more. But as we'll see, the whole point of uh, observing here for Aristotle is still to try to get back to some higher being, which he calls the being of all beings, is what he calls the unmover, uh, the unmoved mover, okay? The unmoved mover, which is like God for him, okay? So basically, Aristotle thinks this. We need to observe the world around us, but what we realize is that in the world around us, all things have purpose. Things are ordered. Now, for the Greeks, especially Aristotle, when things are ordered, they don't just get that way randomly. There must be something that ordered them. And so the point is we start here, and then by using a basically inference, okay, and then deduction, we get our way back to there must be an original thing that put a purpose in everything, including us. And that being is the unmoved mover, or the prime mover unmoved, okay? It's basically a being which does not need to be moved itself, and almost from nothingness itself creates and gives purpose to everything. It's God. And the point of Aristotle's philosophy is to use this world, but eventually to use our reasoning to get back and unite ourselves with the, what the world really is and what our purpose is, the unmoved mover, okay? And we'll see that even though he's facing more in here, it's still, once again, a idea of transcendence. He's still Platonic in that sense. Okay? Now, Nietzsche, you know, you can read a lot of his other books, such as like The Antichrist and uh, some other ones, which he'll talk about how the, this kind of turns into the Judeo-Christian concept of God. We're going to go right to it, though. Okay? Uh, and basically, I mean, eventually Christianity and, and Judaism meets with the Greeks. And what ends up happening is this idea Plato was talking about, going, oh, this idea of the good, and Aristotle's unmoved mover, the Christians and, and, um, and the Judeo-Christian concept was kind of like, hey, okay, that sounds a lot like God. All right, and what ends up happening is we see here the idea of transcendent is continued again. Um, the whole point is, yes, you exist in this world, but this world in front of you is not really what's meaningful. The real world is eternity. You're supposed to do something right here what God wants, so when this world is gone, you can be the real world. This world really isn't anything. The real place we're supposed to be is up there with God. Um, we're supposed to, you know, whether it's give ourselves to our uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, or just to God, the point is we are supposed to do that for eternity. Here, the here and now, the world of appearance, is really nothing. Okay, It doesn't mean anything. What matters is what's above. And we'll see in all three of these, it, what matters is not this place. Okay, It is the good, or the unmoved mover, or the Judeo-Christian con uh, concept of God. The idea of transcending this place to the much better realm. Okay, now, what Nietzsche wants to point out is eventually, okay, this idea of a transcendence begins to turn on itself a bit, but not completely yet, okay? So we get to a point what he calls the death of God. And what Nietzsche basically means the death of God is that God as an authority, or any transcendental being as an authority, okay, is no longer really believed in. 
that we start to go, you know what, I don't really believe there is this transcendental plane, this other place of the intellect or the unmoved mover or God or some divine reason or whatever it is. It's just this, okay? The world we live in now. This is what represents the death of God, that we are just here, we live, and then we die, okay? And, but what happens, he claims, is we get to, this also occurs with an age of nihilism. The point that will you go, well, you know what, okay? This place really means nothing then. All right. Now, how do they get here? And what Nietzsche wants to point out is there's this thing in the age of nihilism called the religious instinct. And it's still there. Okay. Now, what is the religious instinct? It's basically it's our need to obey. Okay. Or our need to create a method to the mayhem. All right. And if you read in passage, uh, I believe it's 53 and Beyond Good and Evil, he says something like, our religious instinct is growing powerfully, but the theistic satisfaction it refuses with deep suspicion. Okay, what does he mean by that? Well, this is what I think Nietzsche is diagnosing, is that for the last 2,000 years, okay, we have been convinced that in order for the place we live in, breathe, eat, sleep, make love in, uh, do our careers in, live our lives in, the world of appearances, our world, okay, for the last 2,000 years since Plato, this world has really meant nothing. The only reason this place has meaning is because we believe there is some higher being, some transcendental thing, which gives it meaning, gives it purpose. We thought of here, we needed it, okay? Here, once again, Aristotle is the unmoved mover needs to give it, and once again, God needs to give us authority. Now, what would happen if, for 2,000 years, we have thought, okay, that we needed a transcendental authority to make this place have meaning, and all of a sudden we get to a time period where we no longer believe in a transcendental meaning. Well, basically what he thinks happens is that we start believing that this place we live in means nothing. It's meaningless. Since there is no transcendental being, and that's necessary to make this place mean something, it's not there, therefore this place must be crap. This place means nothing, okay? And this is the religious instinct. So basically we think we need a transcendental being to have meaning here, yet at the same time we know the theistic satisfaction refused the same time we know there is no transcendental being. So the, uh, the outcome of that is this place means nothing. This is what it means in age of nihilism. Nihilism is nothingness, okay? We believe that this life is, doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. You're born, you die, and that's it, okay? And what Nietzsche is trying to do is saying he's trying to fight nihilism. A lot of people think Nietzsche is a nihilist. He's not. He's just saying that the age we live in is nihilistic, but his main point is we need to get past it. And many people, if you look in the Madman, in that aphorism right here, 125, he's, he is taunting the atheist in this, okay? Now, why is he doing that? Because he thinks the people in this generation, our generation perhaps, think we are so past transcendence that we're outside of it, we're in some new age or something like that. And what Nietzsche is trying to show us is we're not. That this age right here, okay, is nothing but another age of transcendence. It's last age, but possibly its most dangerous and most powerful age. Because what's going on, we still believe we need transcendence. What to overcome it is to get past that idea. Because here, we still think we need it to have meaning. And what Nietzsche's gonna try to show us is transcendence was never needed, okay? We never needed transcendence for our world to have meaning. You do not need a higher being for this place to matter. And what Nietzsche's gonna try to show is how this works, okay? And this is where we start getting to the turn, okay? We have his critique or diagnosis and then he makes a turn of where he's giving his, what he calls, a prelude to a philosophy of the future. He's trying to point it out. Now, the reason Nietzsche is going to be pointing it out, okay, or at least trying to start uncovering it but not show it perfectly, is because he still sees himself in this tradition. Only once we get outside of it can we really know what it's like, but he's doing his best to try to say, okay, even though I'm in this tradition, here's what I think. Okay, and that's what we're going to do in our next video. Um, if you have any questions on this, please email me. I know it's kind of fast, but these are uh, short lectures, right? Um, but please email me anytime, and I'll see you on the second app, and what we're going to talk about is his, like I said, his turn towards the Ubermensch and what he means by that. Okay? Thank you. I'll see you then.